What I'm going to talk about is uh, technology and best practices uh, options for aflatoxin mitigation. And I'm standing in for Amari again, just like the first day. I'm standing in for him uh, because he couldn't come here. And as I mentioned on the first day, he really wanted to be here. And I have been talking to him for the last two days. And every day he's asking me what's happening here. Okay, so he is, uh, he, is, he was really excited that he was going to come here, but he couldn't. Uh, I have very quickly put these presentations together, and it may not actually reflect exactly the same thing as you see in the abstract. Okay? Uh, what I would like to do is, uh, yesterday I talked about biocontrol, so I'm not going to talk about biocontrol here, but I'm going to talk about what are the other technology options that are available and that can be used for aflatoxin mitigation in Africa. Uh, the picture that you see here actually is shelling of groundnut in Senegal. And the mound that you see are shells. And if you go during the harvest season, this is what you see across the entire peanut basin of, of Senegal. And this is how they actually store, mound their peanut kernels, okay? Rest on the ground, it's like, it's like a, a large, large mound. Uh, what I'm gonna do is to, to give you an overview of existing and potential technologies and best practices. And um, initially I was thinking of putting some examples of uh, best practices for scaling up, but I decided not to do it in this presentation right now. But I'll mention whatever is available. First of all, a few aflatoxin facts. And again, I don't know whether I should do it here or not because it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a mycotoxins conference. Uh, but I would like to emphasize what the last speaker mentioned, and that is climate change is going to increase the in incidence of mycotoxins in, in, in various parts of the world, including Africa. And there's a recent report that came out from uh, the United Nations Environmental Program, and that talked about increased uh, what climate change is going to do in terms of increased incidence of poisons in food. And that included both microbials as well as uh, chemical toxicants. It just came out last week and it's something useful to actually look at. Um, I presented this paper, uh, slide in the first day but it's, 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 it really captures everything what happens in Africa. It has aflatoxin and mycotoxins, they have a public health dimension, they have a trade and economy dimension, and they have got a food and nutrition uh, impact dimensions. And uh, over 40% of the commodities in Africa are, are contaminated uh, above the, um, that exceeds the maximum levels in, in, in food. Um, about 30% of the liver cancer cases are, can be attributed to, uh, to, to aflatoxins. And um, the report that came out from the World Bank, I think that particular figure still persists, but I think that needs to be modified. It's not six, seventy million dollars. It's much less than that. But that's what still s stays in the literature. But it's much less than that, that, that impacts on, on, um, on, on trade. And there are many practices because of which uh, aflatoxin contamination remains high in the African food systems. And that, that actually permeates both from the ag agriculture part of it, it permeates to the institutional part, and the policy end of it. So all of them actually contribute together to make this problem so acute in, in the African food system and trade, trading system. Uh, here's some data on, in Gambia, it's a small country, but, and, and groundnut actually contributes 60% of the foreign exchange. And what you can see here is, so as you can see in the last column, that's the column that has aflatoxin levels more than five times what is permissible um, in, 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 in codex. So about 40% of the samples uh, had more than five times what aflatoxin is permissible to. Um, and similarly, you can see in the different regions in, 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 uh, in in, in, in Gambia, what happens there. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty common contaminant there. And again, I showed this slide before, there are large numbers of practices that can be followed for 
uh, for um, mitigation of aflatoxins. I would very, I'll very quickly go through some of the practices that are followed, and I would include some of the work that ICRISAT has done in Africa, in Mali, uh, and some of our own work that we have done, plus some new projects that have come on board uh, from which unpublished data are, are, are available. So number one is the influence of, um, of aflatoxin uh, or, or agronomic and cultural practices on, on aflatoxin incidents. And, and here, what you can see are different agronomic practices here, uh, which includes the incorporation of cereal crop residues, uh, incorporation of farmyard manure, um, liming of soil, and combinations of all of them. And what they found was that if you have both lime and FYM together, you can reduce aflatoxin contamination by about 84%. Um, individually, also, they do reduce contamination levels, uh, but together they do it much, much more than, than, uh, than what they do individually. Now, whether it's practical or not, that's another matter, uh, because, you know, one thing is, it's very difficult to put in something like 400 kg of lime per hectare in smallholder farmer situation, or to put about two and a half tons of, of farmyard manure um, but if they're available, they do help in terms of water conservation and in terms of improving fertility through which the uh, impact on aflatoxin is reduced. Um, ICRISAT has also done work on water conservation practices um, in field, for example, these tied ridges through which one can basically conserve water in the field for a longer period of time and reduce stress on the plant, and uh, reduce stress on the plant would also reduce uh, the predisposing factor for aflatoxin contamination, which is, which is drought. Uh, similarly, water conservation in terms of mulching uh, was found to be very helpful too. Um, I talked about biocontrol, and again, um, as you can see here, this is another country. I didn't present the data last year, uh, yesterday, but one can get a reduction in, in between 86 and 92 percent. These are two years' data um, at harvest and uh, in, during storage in treated versus control, and you can get a large amount of reduction in aflatoxin contamination, and these are in farmer's fields, and these are all farmer-grown farmer crops, and the tests were done in very large, in wider and widespread areas within, the, within each country. It's not just one agro zone, but it's actually a larger areas where the, the tests were done. Um, again, I showed this yesterday, but um, there is a large amount of effort that is going on on, on, on expansion of biocontrol. And we will see much more happening in Africa in the next five years, uh, wherein we anticipate that about half a million hectare of the land will be treated uh, with biocontrol agents. Uh, that's the manufacturing plant that we have created. And we had to create this manufacturing plant to demonstrate that one can actually manufacture, use, and, and market it profitably in the African food systems, in, the, in, the, in African agriculture itself. So now this is going to be just transferred to the private sector in terms of for them to take it over and then carry forward. Um, there are different post-harvest, after, after, after harvest, there are various post-harvest practices that can be used to reduce contamination. Um, one is different kinds of drying and post-harvest uh, uh, post handling uh, method, uh, methods. Uh, what you see on the, on the y-axis is aflatoxin uh, contamination, and various kinds of methods would have various amount of aflatoxin in, um, in, in the crop itself. I'll show you another slide wherein some newer technologies are being tested on a larger scale, and there is a large amount of investment that is going into various kinds of post-harvest management practices, particularly for grain drying and grain storage. A grading has a large amount of impact, as you can imagine. Um, this is, these, are, these two bars are before grading, the amount of aflatoxin that is there, and after grading, you can dramatically reduce the amount of aflatoxin. 
and so the grading has a large amount of impact too. Um, and that, that can be through sorting, and, and this is actually a sorting plant in Mozambique where the women were sorting the, uh, the, 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 the groundnut kernels, and this, is, this was an export house um, on a semi-automated aggregator. Uh, but one can use mechanized color sorter as well. Uh, sorting is also uh, recommended at the farm level, uh, but oftentimes sorting per se is, can be pretty time consuming. But the key issue is that what, what do you do with the, with the culls? Or what do you do with the sorted out material? And our experience and what we have seen is that the sorted out material, particularly in industries like these, are taken back by the women who are sorting, sorting the crop themselves. And they take it back and they either sell it on the roadside or they take it home and cook it as food. Okay, or make a paste and sell it as, as uh, peanut butter. So ultimately from these sorted materials, unless there's a system that is put in place by which the sorted material is taken out of the food system, uh, this actually is increasing the amount of contamination. And it, it's painful to see. I mean, if you go to these sorting houses and look at the women who do it, and you see these piles, bags, which are on the sides, right? And you know, you ask them what they do. They said, we take it home. <coughs> and so we need to get something done to ensure that the sorted out material is out of the food system. It's just like what the, trade, the textile industry is doing in terms of fair trade, for example, or fair match. Uh, similar kind of a system needs to come into place, whereas, whereas the, the export industry, the, the material, the export houses, they should ensure that the crop that is actually left behind in Africa is taken out of the food system. Okay. Um, there's a new project which is called Aflastop. Uh, they are looking at various kinds of newer grain storage practices. And these are six different new storage technologies, which are metal silos, plastic silos, bulk bags, uh, PIX bags, uh, grain pro uh, super bags, and polypropylene bag. And there's a huge amount of data that has been accumulated over the last three years by Meridian Institute and, and ACDI VOCA, wherein they have, they have actually used these bags in real life situation. And they have pinpointed three of these technologies to be carried forward for further scaling up. So they have actually finished the first phase of the project to evaluate what works best in the farming situation. And they are now having three, uh, three uh, particular uh, storage technologies that would be now offered to the private sector for the private sector to manufacture and incentivized for, for scaling out in Africa in the next couple of years. Um, the pigs bags, there's a published literature on that from Ikrisad on that, how effective it is. Uh, clay, if you, if you go into the rural system, then you begin to see what they actually do. Uh, they can be very ingenious. Uh, like in Senegal, we went into a, in, into a local press, and so this is, this is the press that they actually have. That's the, that's the press, and the oil trickles out from here, and that's their oil, and they actually get it tested, and they say, although they say it's 0.05%, what they mean is it's 0.5 ppb, that 0.05 ppb, that's, that's what the, the oil has, but the way they actually do it is, after they get the oil out, they mix it with clay, and then let's the, let's the, let the, the aflatoxin bind to the clay, and then remove the clay, okay? And that's how they get this toxin level down to a very, 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 very large extent, okay? Um, ICRISAT has also started, uh, they have been actually working on ELISA for a long period of time. So they have set up labs for, in the national system, for them to, uh, to analyze aflatoxin uh, and help in both in the trade sector as well as, as well as in the food sector itself. Whatever we do, 
training and, and training of this and providing this access to these technologies are important. And there's a, uh, there should be much more training done than what is done right now. But we have to actually ensure that the farming community and the traders and the entire, entire value chain has the capacity to, to adopt and practice some of these new, newer technologies that are coming, that are coming on board. Um, again, as I showed this, this is made by Amare. Uh, there is a huge amount of effort going on uh, on um, aflatoxin management in Africa. Must be expanded, but there are four pillars upon which the, the management approach should be, uh, should, uh, should be practiced. There's technology, there are policies and institutions, the regulatory framework must be uh, strengthened, and people need to be more aware. Not many people are aware of the dangers of the toxin itself. And what we need is an integrated approach. And I, 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 time and over again, I actually emphasize that. And the integrated approach doesn't actually just mean pre and post harvest. It's much beyond that. It's much, much more beyond that. Uh, it's the entire value chain that needs to be considered. Uh, right from the input market up to the output market. Uh, and it is possible to actually do it under smallholder farming situation. We have actually shown that it can be done. It needs to be scaled up. Uh, so you, you, we need to consider agriculture is no longer, um, it, it's, 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 not a, it's not something that farmers are practicing just for food. It's a business opportunity. So we need to actually consider agriculture as a business, not just in the develop, developed world, but also in the developing world. And if you consider agriculture as a business and then see how you can maximize profits from, from this business, uh, then you begin to make people understand that if they adopt some of these technologies, it makes sense economically and it makes sense both uh, in terms of the health aspect also. Um, so the scaling part, if we normally say that we have, there should be three components. One is the value chain centric, and that's what I was actually emphasizing, that agriculture should be taken as a business. It must be action oriented. Um, we need to actually do practical things to deal with the problem and not just talking about the problem then, per se. We need to take actions and just translate theories into action. And this needs to be done in, with participation of what we call as innovation platforms, which are in participation with the various actors who are affected by this problem. And that is right from the farming community to the policymakers and, 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 the, and the market itself. So in summary, uh, aflatoxin is, is pervasive. Um, there are various efforts that are undergoing, um, that are underway for um, commercializing various, various, uh, various practices for uh, biocontrol and for grain storage and practices. These, these uh, pilots need to be, to be, um, to be upscaled. And I can't overemphasize the importance of PACA in the entire activity. In fact, just next week, there is a conference that is uh, co-sponsored by PACA that is looking at how can grain wastage and spoilage, including aflatoxin contamination and mycotoxin contamination, should, can be reduced in the, um, in the grain reserve stores that, the, that various governments have now. So PACA is actually going ahead and spearheading some of these uh, initiatives and advocating the, the importance of managing af mycotoxins in these, in, in these in, uh, initiatives. I think that's about it I have. Thank you. I would go with this. Um, the, the, 
Yeah. Right. Okay. So what what she's what she asked is about the clay. Uh, uh, what I mentioned was how clay was being used to deto uh, to take out the toxin out of out of oil, but clay has been also advocated for uh, as an additive in food, so that uh, the the populations that are at risk, particularly for the population at risk, if clay is added onto their food, then the chances of the interception can, inter can, uh, can be higher. So what she's asking is what are my, my views on that, okay? So my views on that are this, under emergency situation, yes, but unless clays are accepted by the FDA uh, as something that can be done legally, uh, until that approval is given, I don't know whether the approval is given, has been given or not, unless that approval is given, many of the governments that support these activities, the donors themselves, uh, they are finding it difficult to justify it. But ethically, if you ask me, uh, under emergency situations, like if you have an aphatoxicosis issue in some, some areas, Yes, I mean, un under emergency situations, yes, but as a, as a routine addi additive, um, it's another matter whether it should be used or not, okay? 